Good day in whatever time zone you're in. Um, welcome to the International Association for the Study of the Commons third annual World Commons Week event. My name is Charlie Schweig. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the USA. I'm a member of the International Association for the Study of the Commons Executive Council, and I'm an organizer of the World Commons Week 2020 event. As you may know, World Commons Week is a global annual event celebrating promoting both commons research and practice, and it has two primary components. Um, one is uh, coordinated local events around the world, and the second is a set of regional or continental keynote webinars. Um, this is the keynote webinar for the IASC Europe region, where Professor Dr. Achim Schutler will be giving an approximately 35 minute talk entitled Enclosing Marine and Coastal Commons, which will then be followed by a 15 to 20 minute question and answer period. I'd like to welcome him as well as Professor Inza Thilsfeld, who is ISC's Regional Coordinator for Europe. Inza organized this webinar and will act as the question and answer moderator. To ensure that the webinar functions well, we've limited video um, to the speaker and moderator and the audio for attendees is muted. But attendees, you have the ability to ask a question anytime during the session. Uh, if you scroll your mouse down, um, likely at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q and A button or a function. Um, that's the question and answer function. And there you can type in your questions. After the talk, Inza will read your questions uh, and we'll have the question and answer period. If it appears you need to have a dialogue between you and the speaker, we'll, we'll unmute you. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Inza to introduce our speaker. Inza? Yep. I'm here. Yeah, great. Welcome everybody from my side. Um, this morning it gave me a serious thought of how actually to introduce Achim to you, whom I know since so long. Um, Actually, all my academic life, I must say, when I started my PhD at Humboldt University in Berlin, he was about to finish. So I think that's where we first met. And then I could really witness his journey from agricultural economics to forestry science, and now, for the moment, let's say, ending up in marine sciences. I guess already that short summary of his vita qualifies him perfectly as a common scholar. Because if some of you maybe joined the early career network meeting on Monday, we exactly discussed that. If you need to come from various disciplines and just study the case and the issue and the theme in order to be a common scholar and not so much uh, in your borders of your own discipline. Um, Achim is also a long-standing ISC member and has always been very affiliated to our association. He used different initiatives and programs as I did, but also closely collaborated with Eleanor Ostrom and got engaged in various workshops, conferences, so he's always somebody to count on if I need assistance, help somebody to get engaged with the ISC. So with saying that, we can be really proud that he's a European member and joins our team. So dear European ISC participants, thanks for joining. And when I look here through the um, people who are already in our webinar right now. Some of you just gave your first name, so I cannot really see where you are from, but a particular warm welcome to all of those who are not from Europe and maybe got up very early or stayed up very long to join us right now. Um, with your participation, you really make this World Commons Week happening, which is for us a platform to show, first of all, to the world what we are working on and to show our importance. But at the same time, we try to facilitate with that a platform where you can meet, engage, and talk. And I think particularly during these difficult times right now, it's even more important. 
This brings me to a short opportunity to thank Charlie. I'm sometimes a bit hesitating and have many concerns about running another World Commons Week. And he's always so enthusiastic, get this off the ground and got it going again for this year. So even with less help, so thanks at this point, I just want to mention it once. We are really grateful for his initiative. Achim is currently at the Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research in Bremen, in Germany, and he's Department Head of Social Sciences in this department. And with already having said this, I'm really happy to hand over. Achim, floor is yours. We are interested what you're going to tell us now. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Insa, for this extremely kind uh, introduction. And uh, also thank you to, to Charlie and, and you basically to invite me to that, uh, uh, to that event. It's a very great honor for me to speak here at the uh, World Week of the Commons. Uh, welcome to, to all of you. Um, a special welcome also to my colleagues from the ZMT because somehow we joined that uh, event with our normal Wednesday, Wednesday lunch seminar. And I think that also made particular those in the Americas to, to, to get up pretty early. Sorry for that. Um, when INSA uh, asked me first uh, about uh, joining basically the World Week of the Commons, I was finishing a, a paper which uh, we just recently published or which just recently came out uh, in Ecology and Society and it was about or the title is Broadening the Perspectives on Privatization. And so I thought, oh yes, uh, that's uh, what I'm going to give a talk about. That's what's currently puzzling me. Um, so I'm going to talk about that. And then over the summer holidays, I was really happy that Corona allowed me to hike in the Alps. Uh, and I thought, ah, no, uh, I, I had such an extremely interesting uh, journey to Peru, to Sechura Bay, where I basically observed a case study which uh, put into life what I was, what the, the, the paper in ecology and society is more a conceptual paper. And I thought, okay, I've seen how that is taken to life. And, and, and this is an extremely puzzling case. So I thought, yes, I will talk uh, in that uh, seminar about that case. Obviously, that, that was just uh, a trip uh, re uh, shortly before Corona. So that is still work in progress, but I'm going to develop or we are going to develop papers on that. So I thought that's really nice uh, to, to share that with you. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is basically in closing marine and coastal commons. And the case study is scallop production in Sechura, uh, Peru. And this here is uh, the outline of the talk. So first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, that, uh, that paper in Ecology and Society, ocean and coastal privatization in general, and why I believe it's extremely important to think about it, to think about it now. Then I'm telling you a little bit about the assessment criteria, which we have basically assembled, which we think are important to consider when thinking about ocean and coastal privatization. Then I'm talking briefly about the methodology. And then the most of the talk I'm going to speak about the case study, the Sechura scallop culture, which where the space has been privatized in a pretty rapid uh, process. I'm describing the process. And then I'm using on the one hand the IAD framework to discuss uh, the observed. And then uh, I'm going to discuss uh, the findings basically in the light of the assessment uh, criteria from the article. And I'm going to conclude. Okay, so why is actually ocean and coastal privatization a super important uh, topic we should uh, worry a little bit more about? 71% of the globe is basically, is basically covered by ocean and the excess so far is most uh, often in the public or most of it is basically in the public domain. I'm saying much of it has not yet been privatized. I'm not saying that 
most of it will be privatized shortly, but uh, there is definitely a huge drive or a huge call and desire basically to expanding the economic boundaries within into the marine realm and that expansion of the of the boundaries you uh, leads to an increase in scarcity that increase in scarcity basically asks for an institutionalization uh, which will take place it's not that difficult looking also at other resource systems or at theory to basically predict we are going to have an institutionalization, we are going to need uh, an institutionalization and there are going to be many actors who are trying to basically get privileged rights uh, to, the, to the ocean. Also, we obviously realize that by the increase of the use of the ocean, uh, we are uh, more and more sustainability challenges are coming up, which also needs, uh, needs to be solved. If you're thinking about the oceans 100 years uh, ago, if you were thinking about a commons problem, you, you, you might just have fisheries, which is coming to your mind. And now if you're imagining a, a coastal realm, for example, the amount of different economics activities which are happening there from wind farms uh, to aquaculture uh, to whatever tourism activities and so on you realize there is a lot uh, a lot of increase in scarcity and uh, we would assume that an institutionalization is happening from our perspective it's pretty important actually to understand how this uh, development how it could be shaped towards a holistically sustainable uh, outcome so sustainable sustainability here not only ecological sustainability but also economic or social when we were looking at the literature we, uh, on ocean privatization, we realized that there is rather little done, ra rather little uh, analytical work done so far about ocean privatization, and it's very much dichotomous. Uh, so on the one hand, we have privatization as the glorious uh, solution to the sustainability problem. For example, think about uh, economists praising individual tradable quotas, that's one side. And then on the other hand, we have basically privatization as a rather regressive or excluding thing to happen uh, in the marine realm whatever the, the most prominent uh, term which basically swapped over from the land grabbing uh, discourse is basically ocean grabbing and and many people are basically seeing the next wave of enclosure coming up uh, in the ocean obviously both perspectives could be could be right depending on how how the process is actually shaped and it might depend uh, very much on the details and how it, the process is basically regulated, what the final results and outcomes will be. So from that perspective, we were asking ourselves basically how can we assess or judge on the various uh, empirically observable privatization process and uh, processes and that is what we are, uh, what we have done basically in the paper. And we came up with uh, a whole list of, uh, of criteria, uh, which we're using basically to assessing uh, ocean privatization. I'm not going to tell you about all those uh, factors that would be too much, but I'm focusing on those factors where, uh, which are then later on addressed in the Situra case. So first of all, we think it's important to think about the motivations and drivers of privatization. I already mentioned basically that scarcity can be a huge driver for institutionalization. Overexploitation can be a driver for uh, implementing property rights. On the other hand, uh, it also could be that uh, rent securitization, those actors who are basically 
who are basically developing their economic uh, activity are those who are claiming property rights. Think about uh, the, uh, the, the argumentation of Demzets or uh, Petrovich or, or Alkian, uh, which are basically making that point. Obviously, uh, a motivation and driver could also to incentivize basically innovations. Think about the rights granted for deep sea mining. That would be an example. The second uh, factor, pretty important, uh, is materiality or the biophysical uh, characteristics of the sea, which are basically going to, or, or the particular resource uh, we are talking about, which is going to determine how such an institutionalization or privatization process is basically going to uh, take shape. Another important uh, factor is the institutional repertoire, which exists basically for, uh, for privatization. Imagine, for example, if nobody would have thought about before in, the econo in economics, basically, about quota system, codes and so on, on how to basically privatize to a certain degree um, particular resources, uh, you can't imagine that somebody would have come up with an individual tradable quota system. So from that perspective, you, 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 you are drawing on an institutional repertoire, which is out there. And it's important to, to consider that if you want to assess uh, or, or understand what kind of privatization process might, uh, might happen. Then um, two important factors, which are rather coming out of the out of the grabbing literature on on ocean privatization. These are the distributive effects. Obviously, privatization or institutionalization, in more general, has clear distributive e effects. There are winners and losers. Uh, the distribution of power resources is uh, normally pretty asymmetric, and this has to be has to be studied if you want to understand privatization processes. And that uh, that argument is pretty closely linked to effects on decision making and democracy. Obviously, a privatization process basically shifts the decision power from either everybody was doing whatever he or she wanted uh, to a state decision system or a, a, a common property regime, which then shifts it to private individuals who basically have to a larger or smaller degree the right basically to decide on the resource. Okay, this was all about uh, 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 the paper, and I'm now telling you briefly something about the methodology. Um, probably I have to introduce briefly Lotta Kluger, who is a postdoc uh, at our institute, and she has helped me very much, and, and she is studying Sechura Bay since uh, 2013, and uh, with a lot of discussion, she is the expert of the Bay, and with a lot of uh, discussion that basically intrigued me about that, uh, that case, and she took me with her um, to basically visit the place in 2019 uh, for that talk. Basically, we have, uh, or I have um, studied a number of documents and basically those discussions with Lotta and a lot of schedule-based explorative interviews I've done uh, last year are basically the source of that uh, talk. And uh, then I'm building my, my discussion on the IAD framework on, and on my set of criteria. So to basically present you the story in a nutshell and to just show you the starting and uh, the end of the process, uh, on the left side, you find uh, the open access uh, situation in 1990. It draws, I mean, it's obviously a Google Maps uh, from more recently where you can't see anything and uh, where you see no zonation at all. And it also would not be completely right saying that there was nothing in 1990. There were basically fishers who were doing wild catch fishery and there have been also uh, some conflicts with them, but there was no uh, scallop production at all, no 
property rights basically associated uh, to the production uh, there. And that has shifted dramatically. And uh, this on the right side, you, you see basically the uh, cadastral uh, map uh, in the year 2020. And there are clearly allocated plots of 100 hectares each. And uh, you have basically 158 concessions in the entire bay. And you also realize uh, that that basically covers uh, the entire bay. Since uh, 2015, uh, that, uh, that does not only allocate rights to individual or groups uh, of the bottom, where basically the scallop culture is done, but it also includes uh, the water column and the surface uh, of the water. So this is the starting and the end point. Here is a picture of the scallop about the resource uh, we are talking about. Um, and uh, this is basically how the uh, how the scallops are ending up. Uh, they are pretty famous for particularly French uh, cuisine. Uh, a lot of uh, people in November, December uh, are waiting in the supermarkets in France uh, to, to get the scallops, the deep frozen scallops. And Sichuda is basically providing a lot uh, for it. You can imagine that this is an extremely highly uh, valued commodity. For showing you a little bit the, the, the dimension or the magnitude basically of uh, the issue, uh, here on the left side, you uh, find a graph on the bivalve production uh, capture versus aquaculture. I don't know those who, of you who are working in the fishery sector might know that graph uh, of the FAO where they are showing the development of uh, wild catch fishery versus uh, aquaculture production over uh, the last um, 30 years, basically. And uh, it basically shows uh, how it developed over 30 years from nearly no production to actually getting 50% of uh, protein production uh, from fish is basically done today in fisheries. And if you are now looking at bivalve production, it also starts as a rod at an extremely low uh, level. Uh, and it has developed over the last 40, 50 years that it's largely dominating uh, actually the entire uh, production having 80% 80 per, 80 of the production share. And you can imagine that such an expansion actually creates, creates a, a problem about uh, space uh, and so on. So you have an immense increase uh, in aquacultural scallop uh, production or bivalve production in general, but also scallop uh, production. Peru is a pretty large player in that. It's uh, the fourth largest producers worldwide. It's a super uh, important uh, market and business. On the right side, you see basically uh, the development. Uh, it's uh, basically 180 uh, million uh, uh, dollar market uh, for Peru, which is for them pretty substantial. What you also see is that there are some erratic um, uh, changes in the market. And you also see that basically the majority of it is uh, basically produced uh, for the export markets of France, uh, USA, uh, and so on. Citura produces, that single bay produces 80% of the Peruvian scallops, 50% of Latin American scallops, and has basically a share of 3.7% uh, of the well scallop uh, production, which is pretty substantial for an individual bay. Now, most of you might not be familiar uh, with scallop uh, 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 culture and that particular form of scallop uh, culture. Therefore, I will explain you briefly the, tap, uh, the, top, uh, 
the technique. So it's a, a bottom culture. So basically the seeds are brought into the plot. They are lying on the bottom. So it's not a sustained, suspended uh, culture where uh, the seeds are basically in, in a series of nets, but uh, things are basically put, uh, to, uh, the, the seed, seeds are basically put uh, to uh, the bottom, then starts a grow out cycle while you have to basically carefully monitoring uh, the, the plots. The seeds which are brought into the plot are pretty costly. They invest roughly in an area of 100 hectares. Uh, farmers by, or agriculturalists basically put 35,000 uh, euros of scallops into that plot. So you can imagine you're really taking care uh, of that plot. It's monitored 24-7. Uh, 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 they are grown out and then harvested uh, by divers as you're seeing compressor divers as you see them on the second uh, picture. They are brought to the harbor and they need to be processed uh, quickly. They are packed frozen and shipped uh, to other markets. So, so that processing quickly is pretty important. Okay, now after uh, the process basically, or the production process, I'm telling you something about the, the, the story of the production, uh, of the privatization process. So in 1991, First small fishers from Pisco, so from the south of Peru, arrived to, uh, to start basically scallop culture in Sechura, and it started basically with an open access uh, situation in that sense that nothing was regulated about that uh, particular plot. As already indicated, there have been traditional fishing, uh, small scale fishing going on uh, in that bay. In 2001, we have then a first aquacultural law, and that grants rights to the resource, uh, to the bottom basically, but not to the water column or surface. And what is pretty special about that uh, rule was basically um, bottom culture is the form of scallop production, which is relatively low investment incent uh, intensive, and uh, also that have been small scale fishers who came there. So they managed to get a right through which limited uh, the, 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 the possibility to get a concession to small scale fishers and to fishers associations. So only cooperatives could get, <clears throat> could get the right to a concession. 2003, first, uh, three first concessions were granted and then started a rush until 2015 towards Sechura and 158 concessions are granted with de facto actually no access to water, uh, to the water column or the surface. De facto, basically you're chased out of the area with a gun in case you're trying to enter. In 2015, a uh, second aquacultural law was uh, passed that requ required basically that a formal company, and OSPA is just an association and does not need to have uh, proper bookkeeping and so on. And there, the law changed that you have to have a formal company, company uh, structure, a kind of limited liability company. And it also allowed private organizations and, and individuals to hold uh, uh, licenses uh, de facto and the euro laws have been aligned and now it gives you basically uh, the right to the bottom to the water column and to the surface uh, that is what you can hold as a concession holder so from that perspective we now have a de facto and de jure privatization of the of the plot uh, so this was more the formal side, what happened uh, to the informal side. So fishers start with uh, in, in small scale. They have at the beginning huge gains, which basically led uh, to that gold rush I was talking about uh, due to climate, particularly climate variability, but also uh, market variability. There, uh, there arrived huge losses and that basically uh, that basically were too heavy 
for a lot of small scale fishers. And that leads to the development of joint contracts uh, with processing firms and uh, individual, uh, individual investors. Basically, they are starting sharing agreements between OSPAs, who are the only who can hold concessions, and the companies. They have uh, sharing contracts, which are 50-50, 40-60, 30-70, 10-90, and uh, you have also a lot of leasing contracts where basically um, the uh, OSPA is leasing out uh, the, uh, the right to, uh, to, to manage and to harvest the plot to, uh, to an, a firm or investor. Currently, 40% of uh, the plots are under those leasing contracts. So from that perspective, we see basically that fishers are becoming uh, subcontractors, they are becoming laborers employed, in many cases employed, depending on the sharing contract, but they are becoming basically laborers in their own concession. That is uh, to a certain degree rather good in that sense that it's a risk uh, sharing advice and uh, from, from the perspective of uh, the fishers and uh, on the other hand from the processing firms that's basically a way of of, uh, of controlling better the production process, not having to ask an entire cooperative when we should start harvesting, but having basically the right to say, now it's the good time, it's the optimal weather condition, the optimal climate condition, it's the optimal market situation and so on. And that's uh, how it developed. You also find on the formal scale, uh, a kind of, uh, or, or in, in terms of concession holding, uh, you fi find a process of informal tunneling of those OSPAs. So on the one hand, uh, certain members are convinced or thrown out, uh, out of OSPAs and uh, basically processing firms or investors are bringing in their friends and allied basically who always vote uh, for them or you have another process uh, informal process where basically as there is not a proper tender system for basically reallocating reallocating concessions basically you convince an ospa to hand to to give a concession back and right at that moment you are coming in with your uh, with your new uh, ospa which you have basically created uh, as a kind of uh, um, extension of uh, a private actor. Since 2015, this kind of informal tunneling process are not anymore needed because you can basically uh, formalize that ownership structure as a private entity. Uh, there are now uh, actors which are controlling up to 10 uh, concessions and uh, a rest of basically 10% of the concessions are still fully controlled uh, by OSPAS. The others are a, either in full control of the investor or uh, any kind of shared agreement. Okay, so how do I basically try to understand that institutional um, evolution with the help of the IAD framework. So having those laws and having basically a situation from open access to actually private concessions in 2020. What, are what is basically our action situations that the struggle about space for lucrative uh, production of scallops? What are the actors? There are obviously many more actors, but uh, uh, for the sake of time, we're just focusing uh, on four and the two most important are basically the sc small scale fishers and the scallop processors and the investors, which might be individuals or firms, and you have the national and the regional uh, government. What are basically the biophysical uh, characteristics and the biophysical environment? The seedlings, uh, the seedlings are extremely uh, costly, even if they are caught in the wild, uh, they, uh, which the majority is, you have to get them uh, from far, you have to dive uh, uh, for them and so on. And as said, you are basically 
putting 35,000 euros uh, into a plot. It's an extremely risky environment. Uh, there on the second graph, uh, you see uh, basically the relationship between temperature changes and the uh, scale of production. So it's very, very much temperature related uh, production risks. You have algal blooms. Um, uh, uh, um, yeah, infections basically that kill a lot of uh, a, a lot of scallops and so on. You have a huge costs on monitoring and enforcement. Uh, they have basically installed boats there, which are out there in the bay at two kilometers roughly away from the shore, uh, uh, where you have a lot of boats who are monitoring that. And as I already explained it, basically the state does not do anything; it grants uh, the rights, but you have to defend it with your own uh, gun. Uh, scallops, that's also an important uh, physical characteristic. They are deteriorating quickly, so you have a strong reliance on quick processing. There are a lot of price risks. So in a nutshell, uh, this is basically a high risk, high gain, and high loss uh, production process. The socioeconomic conditions are obviously pretty different between small scale fisher and the high potential, so the private individuals or firms. The small scale fishers, uh, they have been at, at early entrepreneurs being able to get extremely high uh, returns. They have uh, limited financial resources and uh, reduced ability to take risks. They have uh, made a lot of earnings at the beginning, but they have been used up pretty quickly and they were lacking uh, collaterals. The high potential firms, they have more economic ability and a lot of uh, financial possibility. They have a lot of knowledge. They either buy in marine, uh, marine biologists or they are marine biologists uh, themselves and they are controlling the production process. Two institutionally, uh, institutional arrangements which have been pretty important. On the one side, these are turfs, so territorial use rights for fishers, um, which have developed basically since uh, the 80s and have been very much en vogue in that time when the first law passed. And then on the other hand, you have the national government, which sees a strategic importance for revenues in that sector and you have a governance shift or that basically good governance means that you have a formalization, recentralization became an issue in the Peruvian uh, legislation and that taxation is basically uh, an important uh, issue. So going through that process with the help of the IAD framework. So you have small scale fishers who find basically that economic uh, potential, which leads basically to a gold rush. And that gold rush basically makes it necessary that they need to secure their property rights. They have basically TERVs uh, as an institutional structure uh, available for them that's at fashion and that makes them uh, basically to put a law through that they get exclusive rights to basically uh, cooperatives. However, that meets a costly, risky and uh, requiring sick, uh, uh, quick processing resource uh, and uh, this is basically combined with the socio-economic conditions that basically small-scale fishers are economically extremely vulnerable. At that time, basically, those high potentials uh, enter the scene. As they have seen, there are huge uh, returns. And uh, we get at that moment uh, a huge downturn, the crisis, particularly due to, uh, particularly due to uh, climate uh, variability. And that uh, leads to a lot of uh, bankruptcy, uh, a lot of coalition, as I have described, and uh, take over. Those actors, basically, the high potential, see again uh, that need basically to secure their property rights. And that moment, basically, that idea of formalization uh, and taxation, and obviously the knowing of a lot of people in, uh, at the national level in, uh, in Lima, basically makes it possible to uh, give concession to 
private actors which are basically also giving you the right uh, to the water column and uh, uh, the surface, which is pretty important to control entirely the production process. So what we see is basically uh, de facto and uh, the Europe privatization or enclosure of the commons. What can we say basically in the light of our uh, assessment uh, framework or assessment criteria? So in both cases, the motivation and drivers have been that the actors wanted to secure their rents. The small scale fishers wanted to have clear boundaries, clear access right and to know, okay, the resource is mine, which is in the plot. The, uh, uh, the high potentials basically wanted to make the production process more predictable and controllable. In both cases, environmental concerns did not play a role in the process of uh, institutionalization. In relation to the material characteristics, as already mentioned, you have high costs, high risks, you have the difficulties to exclude. And that basically leads to the impossibility of economically and knowledgeable weak small scale fishers to, uh, to survive basically when shock arrives and the high potentials have all uh, have a lot more capabilities to take over the risk. So from that perspective, you have extremely asymmetric bargaining positions. Uh, so for example, processing access, price setting, uh, access to capital and access uh, to knowledge. An important uh, aspect was basically the institutional repertoire, so that dominating discourse of availability of terms, which basically enabled the small scale fishers who had some disadvantage in getting hurt in the political process, but nevertheless, uh, they have been able to put basically that into uh, the legislation. Distributive effects, if you're thinking about them, it very much the story sounds like a very conventional process as described in the ocean grabbing literature. But you also see that basically the law was at the beginning in the favor of the weak, but then came the biophysical and the socioeconomic properties and that led basically to a de facto change to private property. Uh, effects on decision making and de democracy. Basically, the first uh, uh, the first law basically excluded those fishers who have been there before, but nevertheless gave the right to the small scale fishers who were entering uh, the businesses. And now, basically, the the decisions are taken by private and rather powerful actors who are controlling the process. So to conclude, I'm realizing I'm, I, I'm getting to the end. My 35 minutes are nearly taken up. So what you see is, yes, there is definitely a huge pressure on coastal resources. So blue growth is happening there. That leads to a lot of resource conflict and the need for institutionalization. More exclusive property rights have been the uh, effect. This entailed the danger of distributive uh, issues in the form of uh, grabbing and particularly the unequal distribution of power resources. So the ability to take risk material property of the resources basically led uh, to a concentration in the process and that would have to be considered if uh, going on in that process. Okay, thank you uh, very much for your attention. It's not yet time uh, for lunch, but I hope uh, when you get it, you will get such a good one uh, as this one. Thanks a lot, and I'm looking forward to uh, discussion. Yeah, thank you, Achim. That was very detailed insights into formal and informal rules, so I guess, or I would say it's exactly one of the core topics we like to discuss within our groups. Um, let's get started right away. But before I take up the first question, I would like to let everybody know again or mention to you, you can write your questions in the questions and answer box and it will open if you go down on your screen on that icon so that we can see them all. Um, 
Yeah, the first question is from Nadesh, and um, it's about your criteria in the beginning. And I guess uh, the person would like to know if you had those criteria for assessing ocean privatization before you start looking at the case, or if that has been something that came out of your empirical research. Yeah, that, that is a very good uh, good question. Basically, we started with that uh, we started with that paper a lot prior to me going to uh, going to Satura. It is basically the outcome of uh, a cost network, uh, ocean governance for sustainability, and uh, various scholars and interdisciplinary group, basically Martin Bubbing, Maria Hachi Michael, Irmak Erturk, and Stefan Pardolo, uh, we sat together before it was even a bigger group, but that was the final group which basically uh, wrote the paper. So they are coming from different disciplines, uh, working all on the marine realm, and we, are, we were basically taking the literature on what is out there in the different disciplines, and we're coming up uh, with uh, with the criteria we then basically we then basically used for that case. Thanks. So from, the next that, from that perspective, it's somehow an inductively derived list of questions from the literature. I have another very particular question here from Oscar. It's about. Um, if you are able to upscaling uh, your case, first of all, why is it so concentrated in the, the scholar production in your case study? Is it everywhere like this in Peru? Or are there many different forms of such kind of production? I mean, I guess we can summarize this question. And is this very particular or do we learn from the this case for broader thoughts. Yeah, uh, basically you have uh, two forms of production and that's basically uh, the bottom culture and the suspended culture. Uh, you have it basically in, in the suspended culture. You have the problem that basically the investment uh, costs are so high uh, that small scale fishers would not be able to basically run such a process, but you need uh, large, uh, large investments uh, for, uh, for doing that uh, production process. If you're thinking about uh, that, is that basically, uh, ca can you draw lessons uh, from that particular case on, uh, on other cases? Uh, then one could say, okay, and comparing it in particular with uh, the grabbing literature, uh, then you would say, okay, in many, many different realms, even not only in relation to scallop culture, uh, you, you find pretty similar processes of privatization where basically you need a lot of capital, uh, where there is a lot of risk uh, involved in the production process. But uh, I think uh, describing basically the fundamental characteristics of the production process uh, basically helps you to understand why uh, the, the, the process is developing as it is developing. That does not yet say that this is basically the right or the wrong way of how it is basically uh, developing because it might just be an impossibility for a small scale fishers to take such huge risk. But if you are saying, okay, there are good advantages, for example, to keeping a certain type of common property regime, then you also have to think about how you can basically mitigate what you can basically do as an institutional setup uh, to avoid basically those uh, pitfalls or those problems in production, whatever, a credit scheme, um, savings scheme, whatever, uh, contribu uh, distribution of knowledge, which is 
to a certain degree would be a public good. So there would be no harm if every individual uh, small scale farmer would know how the, pro uh, how the production mm -hmm. process works and that knowledge is shared. But as it is basically produced by the large producers who have no incentive basically to share it, then obviously you crowd out, uh, you throw out basically those small uh, scale producers mm -hmm. and you could change the institutional setup. Uh, I'm not judging on what would be right or wrong, but you could change the institutional setup and uh, basically thereby allowing small scale fishers to stay in the business or to make it yeah. a little bit easier. That, that links over to the next question here from Matthias Wolf. Um, <clears throat> he wants to know if you can mention some exact local policies that would help that small fishermen can stay in business. Yeah, I mean, one mm. one example I've just uh, I've just mentioned, uh, for example, um, yeah, uh, distributing distributing basically sharing uh, the knowledge, uh, whatever, making publicly available uh, the climate conditions, whatever when something uh, is going wrong. Uh, infrastructural needs at the moment, the infrastructure basically to protest, to process uh, the scallops are uh, all in private hands and that creates a, a clear bottleneck uh, for production. I'm not saying that you should, should socialize basically, uh, basically the entire production process, but uh, you nevertheless uh, could create uh, forms on how basically to allocate be uh, better the time when when it's basically your turn uh, in harvesting and so on. So there would be various means on what you could do basically to ease the situation for uh, small scale producers, which which would be in many cases kind of co cooperative. Uh, forms of uh, production. I mean, if you're thinking about, uh, inside you're from the agricultural sector, how dairy farm, uh, how dairy companies and so on have been uh, developed uh, or, or yeah, uh, built uh, in the past, that would be all examples you could basically also apply to that sector. Mm. I have now a typical framework question, which is rather technical. Maybe you can also answer that, Achim. Why did you assign risk, gain, and loss production processes to biophysical environment and not to social economic conditions? Ah, that's a that, that's a very good uh, that, that's a very good uh, that's a very good question, um, and somehow, I mean the the the, the most important risk, which basically. Uh, which basically um, led to to the downturn and to the bankruptcy has been uh, has been basically the climatic risks. Yeah? So basically, the dying of a lot of scallops and the thirty thousand euros plus the monitoring money uh, was basically, or or the whatever six seven month uh, of of basically taking care of the production were basically lost, and that's basically a biophysical uh, characteristic of the bay and of uh, the resource itself, which just uh, doesn't thrive if, you, if you're reaching a certain uh, temperature. And uh, if you're thinking, uh, it's very difficult to think about an, another important risk is basically that the product deteriorates quickly. Uh, that's also a characteristic of the resource. The market risk I mean, there it, it's more difficult uh, to, to basically say, okay, a market risk is a biophysical uh, risk uh, to a certain degree, uh, and it might be more a socioeconomic attribute, whatever preferences of people, and there you're right, it might be better allocated in that other box. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, that is also to a certain degree uh, determined, for example, that it deteriorates pretty quickly. That makes, that gives uh, the processors that market power to basically determine uh, the price. But you're right, uh, yeah, one could think about where to basically allocate it, uh, each individual risk. Mm -hmm. Now I have a question seems to be from an insider of the area that person would like to know if we should, uh, why did you not consider weak 
as the local farmers before 1990. Why did in that case, the what? Maybe you can also read it in the question box. Why not considering the weak those local fishers in Sashua before 1990? In that case, the law did not benefit them, but the migrant fisheries from Pisco. Yeah, I mean, um, I have difficulties to find the appropriate question, but I think uh, the the uh, the question. But I think I got uh, what you, what you were saying, and also relating to relating it to uh, the knowledge of the case. I mean, I've I, I basically basically told you that there has been that there has been uh, a huge conflict between those fishers who used to be before in that area and who w were doing wild catch fisheries and those who came uh, from pisco on, and who were already able to basically uh, to basically manage that production technique uh, and they have basically, as they had uh, the ability to change basically the law and get uh, uh, own concessions, that has basically has basically been the first process of, of enclosure. But interestingly enough, that was an enclosure which gave the right to commoners, basically to a group uh, of people. So from that perspective, yes, indeed, uh, one, should, one should also consider uh, that process of, uh, of institutional uh, institutionalization, where basically the passing from uh, 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 um, an open access regime to a common property regime also uh, already excluded uh, people. But I mean, that is basically an effect which you find quite often when TERFs, uh, so territorial use rights for fishers, are basically done. They have usually a space dimension, so they are related to a particular area. And that means that, I mean, if, if you think about, uh, I think it's uh, design principle one, <laughs> clear boundaries. Yeah. Uh, so basically you have to determine who is in and who is out, but with the way of institutions, how they emerged in fisheries, uh, they have been in the past often not being related to a particular space, but you had a rights for migrant fishers who had the right basically to come in. And now you're basically institutionalizing uh, a system which is related to territory. And then you're running the risk of basically uh, locking people out and creating somehow uh, a dis distortion within the entire system. Yes, a very, a, a very, very interesting uh, thing also to study. And I told basically the story from the 90s onwards mm -hmm. or from 1991. Yeah. But that's right. It's uh, super interesting. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. For I the think question. we have two, three minutes left. So I would like to combine two questions, which I see here on the screen. And that's nice to end with those because they are a bit forward looking about your predictions for the future. So still also Gustavo would like to know what happens if oil platform development is no planned in this area. What would that mean for privatization processes? And then maybe you can even generalize from that question if that's possible. But looking at other cases, uh, Charlie would like to know if we see more and more coastal enclosure in form of offshore wind energy coming into those kind of systems. Also complex overlapping offshore enclosure across different industries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the the question from Gustavo that just makes me think of a of a case in in Senegal uh, where they have already that that's more advanced uh, the oil and gas drilling uh, than in um, in, in uh, at the coast of uh, Peru um, and there it's pretty clear I mean the oil industry has much stronger power than even those uh, companies um, uh, even those companies which are operating uh, uh, now 
the, the big operators in Setsura, but obviously I, that would be just my prediction from not having studied basically uh, the power resources of the different, different actors, but that would be my prediction. And uh, thinking about uh, Charlie's question uh, in relation to wind farm, I mean, what you find in general is that due to the expansion of, of activities, you find a lot of... Uh, yeah, you, you find a lot of conflicts and enclosure of the marine area. If you think about all the marine uh, spatial planning processes happening uh, basically everywhere in, in the world, you see that institutionalization takes place. It's an interesting thing, uh, and it depends very much on the legislation of each individual, uh, of each individual country if wind farms and aquaculture are basically in a huge conflict because basically wind farms exclude normally fishers uh, so wild catch fisheries yeah but they might give uh, certain uh, certain possibilities for aquaculture basically and i mean having those huge pillars <laughs> in the sea uh, can be pretty advant uh, advantages yeah and uh, uh, if you think there the the externalities basically involved might be actually to a certain degree a positive that's different for example if you have a competition between aquaculture producers and uh, aquaculture producers and the tourism sector, particularly those who are using cages and pens, uh, they have no possibility against the rather powerful tourism industry. Bottom culture, which is basically chasing out all the fishers, might, uh, on the other hand, be no problem for tourism operators. So it, it really depends, and it's very case specific, and you would have to study that in detail. Well, Thanks, Achim, and thanks to the participants for this. I think we could go on for a little while, but unfortunately, we will stop now <laughs> and give Charlie the floor to show us what could be next. Or... Well, Achim, thank you so much. That was a really interesting talk. Um, yeah, I have, I have more questions, and I find it fascinating. Uh, but let me, uh, at this point, we want to stop at the top of the hour. It's the top of the hour. Um, let me uh, close the ISC European Regional Keynote Address with a few final points. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. I just wanted to give you a little history of what's happened this week with World Commons Week and what's still to come. Um, you can see the North American talk has been given uh, and that recording is available on the World Commons Week 2020 website at the URL at the bottom of the screen. Um, I just want to get my... Uh, uh, this is the uh, the Latin American one has also been completed. Again, uh, that recording is already available for you if you want to uh, watch it. Um, that one was in Spanish. Uh, we've completed the African keynote, uh, which also is available, the recording. Uh, uh, yesterday, I think, I'm starting to lose track of the days, um, Oceana um, was, uh, provide, uh, did a keynote, and that one we did a, actually a 30-minute documentary uh, produced by the speaker. Um, that documentary is not linked. Um, um, hopefully, we will get it there, but uh, the Q&A is. Uh, today, uh, China is having their uh, keynote. This will be in Chinese, uh, and again, the recording will be available. Um, and then uh, I just want to do a special shout out to tomorrow's um, Early Career Network, which is a new uh, keynote we, uh, this year. We haven't done this in the past, but it's, there's a wonderful uh, um, uh, collective action happening with early career IASC academics, um, and uh, I hope we'll see uh, people at this tomorrow. That'll be a two-hour session, actually. And then uh, we'll close out on October 9th in Asia, where Aline uh, Delaney will be talking about uh, another Coastal Commons uh, talk. So uh, the last couple things I'll say is that we've, um, as you may know, we have uh, local events participating. Uh, this has been a strange year, as we all know, with uh, COVID. Uh, many of these local events are, are online, or almost all of them, but we're, uh, I'm happy to say that we have more uh, locations participating this year than in any year before, so we're continuing to grow. Uh, I want to plant the seed for anybody to consider doing a local event next year around this time. And also around this time next year um, is the uh, biennial ISC conference. 
um, which is um, uh, at Arizona State University. On the left, you can see the uh, timeline for uh, uh, papers. Um, it isn't clear, of course, whether this will be in person or online. But I also wanted to uh, point you to the virtual events that are being um, built starting in February of 2021 on the right hand side um, that'll be happening all year next year, um, in part because of the COVID. Um, we're doing um, efforts around online. So uh, we have no way um, uh, to clap into this um, technology right now, but I, I'd like to at least encourage participants to give a high five using the hand signal and the participants thank them for a wonderful talk and we're starting to see the high fives happening. Um, this, we had a really wonderful uh, group of attendees. Um, we are so appreciative for your time and attention today. Enza, thank you for organizing this keynote and especially to Hakeem for uh, preparing what really was a fascinating keynote. On a side note, I'm teaching a graduate seminar right now called Governing the Commons. And I'm going to point my students to the paper you cited in this talk. Um, it really fits with what I've been talking about to my students. Um, so this concludes the IESC European Regional uh, keynote webinar. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, thanks and enjoy the rest of your day, whatever time zone you're in. At this point, we're going to close out. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. I'm going to turn recording off.